good morning, everyone. It is uh, it's great to be with you. And um, yeah, as we get ready to do this, I, I'm just thinking it has been such a strange couple of weeks um, here. Week before last, we saw this cloud gathering on the horizon, and now it's sort of changed the way that that all of us live. And I don't know if you're like me, but um, I've kind of run a, a range of emotions, really um, quite a spectrum of emotions, um, being really disappointed um, to being really concerned for people, for my family, health, those kinds of things, um, to just wanting everything to go back to the way that it has been for so long and we're so used to, and uh, even kind of grieving over that. Um, and and then also anticipation <laughs> is another emotion uh, that I have, uh, that I've had over, over the last few days of just wondering, what is God doing? And um, how is this going to be a good thing? And, and I, really, I really think that it is. Um, so... Um, just wanted to say a couple of preliminary uh, remarks. This uh, session this morning uh, is really part of our experiment. Uh, so this is our first stab at doing uh, a sermon like this. And, and, and so I hope that you'll bear with me um, because uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get better at it as we go. Uh, obviously, this is being recorded. It's Friday afternoon, um, and, uh, and hopefully you're watching this on Sunday morning. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that in the future we're going to pr- progress beyond this and uh, actually be live streaming uh, our services uh, in the future because from everything that we've heard, and I haven't really looked at the news today, uh, this could go on for a while. And so uh, with that in mind, I anticipate that we're going, going to improve uh, in our skills quite a bit. So uh, with that said, just some preliminary remarks. Uh, remarks. I... Um, Really glad to join you via this technology, and I also want to thank my helpers, Garrett, uh, Lacey, and Seth, uh, who are helping me with audio and and the video portion today. So uh, when you see them, give them a thumbs up and, and express your gratitude to them. So we are in the book of Haggai um, this morning, and uh, I think it's going to be a great uh, book. I don't know about you, but I have really really enjoyed our time in the Minor Prophets. This will be our eighth one and actually our last one. We're going to end with Haggai. We've been going in an eight-week series, and it's been amazing. we've called this series uh, The Heart of God Through the Voice of the Prophets. And, um, and so really, what do we learn about God and what God cares about from what these sometimes depicted as angry men had to say uh, to their context? And I think that we've learned a lot. Uh, I think that we've seen that God uh, has uh, special protection and special love for his people, even when they're disobeying him, Obadiah. Uh, I think that we see that it's what's on the inside that matters more than what's on the outside, Amos, in the book of Amos. Uh, I I think that we have seen that God holds all nations responsible uh, for their behavior, and he calls them into account like Assyria, In the book of Nahum, uh, I I think that uh, we have seen that one thing that you and I absolutely must prepare for is the day of the Lord, uh, the final day of the Lord when Christ returns. We must be ready. Uh, The book of Zephaniah. Um, I think that we've seen that uh, the key to understanding life is not knowing why, but knowing who to trust and who will satisfy Habakkuk. Uh, And then we've seen that Joel calls us to responsive repentance uh, from uh, a life of self-orientation and sin, um, and that through that, God's blessing uh, and grace come to us. And so uh, it's really been a great time. I've really gained an appreciation uh, for the minor prophets and, and just what they had to say and how relevant it is uh, to our own lives. So uh, we're, we're in the book of Haggai. Uh, the book of Haggai is in between Zephaniah and Zechariah, the two Zs of the minor prophets. And so you go right in between those and you'll find Haggai. And so as we get started this morning, why don't we just uh, go to prayer uh, together and uh, commit this time to the Lord um, and, uh, and just pray that he'll work in our hearts as we work through uh, this book. 
Father God, we thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you, Lord, for each person uh, who is watching. I pray, God, uh, that as Grace Point um, and maybe some other people are scattered around, uh, that you would meet with all of us together, Lord, uh, in the Spirit uh, and in our hearts. I pray, God, that we would hear your voice through Haggai. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for its relevance to our lives, what it has to say to us, uh, what you have to say to us. And so I pray that you would help me today uh, speak clearly, and um, we ask this all in your name. Amen. Well, we're in the end, Haggai, and uh, Haggai is one of those prophets that actually comes after a lot of the bad stuff uh, that Israel and Judah had gone through. In fact, Haggai is one of the books that's unusual in the sense that we can date it very specifically. We know that Haggai, we didn't really know when Joel was written, but it didn't really make a difference to the message. But we know when Haggai's written, 520 BC. In fact, it's written uh, over a four-month period uh, between August, the end of August, and uh, mid-December or so. Uh, Haggai gives uh, these messages that we have in, in, in the second shortest book in the Old Testament, two chapters. Uh, I think it's 38 verses, if I remember right, uh, is all that Haggai has to say to us. And so just to give you a little bit of historical context, uh, Israel had been uh, deported and dispersed, the the northern kingdom of Israel, by Assyria uh, some centuries before, about two centuries uh, before Haggai. Judah, having not learned from what happened to Israel, went down the same course of idolatry and injustice in their society. Uh, And so that God finally disciplined them, just keeping his promises, as he said he would do in Deuteronomy. And uh, the Babylonians came in, destroyed Jerusalem, sacked it, and deported uh, the uh, people of Judah and Jerusalem off to Babylon. And God had said... Uh, You'll be there 70 years. You might as well get used to it. And at the end of 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. Well, guess what? True to God's word, true to form, that's exactly what happened. And in the year 539, Cyrus, the Persian king, came and conquered Babylonia. And in 538 BC, he issued an edict or a decree that allowed the Jews to return to their homeland the land of Canaan, Abraham, what was promised to Abraham, uh, and that they had uh, settled. And and so they were able to return, and return, uh, many of them did. They did in waves, but the first wave went out in 538. And they returned, and they came back to a land that was less than ideal. I mean, it wasn't really, I mean, in, in many ways, it probably would have been better practically for them to stay in Babylonia um, because it was a developed country and people had been living there. When they come back to the land of Israel, it's kind of a a destitute and rugged place to live, not an easy place for them to start up a life and make a living. And uh, hardly the kind of place that you want to, you know, make your go at, Uh, except that this was their homeland. This was the land of their identity, And uh, it was their roots. It was the land that was part of their heritage. They had been given to them by God. And so they came back and they immediately began to build the temple because the temple had been such a centerpiece uh, in, uh, in their life and part of their national identity. Haggai was a contemporary with another prophet, uh, Zechariah, whose book comes uh, right after. And it's into this situation with the exiles returning back into the land of Judah and seeking to settle Jerusalem again that Haggai comes on the scene. And, uh, and, and so we know um, the time frame and the context of what was going on. Haggai uh, finds uh, something different or his setting is different than many of the other minor prophets because um, they confronted violence Um, They confronted injustice by and large. Haggai comes on the scene and what he finds is more spiritual apathy and discouragement. So let's let's look at what he actually has to say in chapter one. Now let's just, we'll just pick up and and look at the first uh, four verses of chapter one. It says, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, uh, Jehozadak, 
the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? And so uh, he raises the whole issue. And from uh, the outset, one of the things that we see is that Haggai's not speaking his own opinions. In fact, one of the things you see through this whole book is that he often says, so declares the Lord Almighty, or thus says the Lord Almighty. And so Haggai is very much uh, emphasizing the fact that his message comes from the Lord. And so it's the Lord who is speaking. So what does he have to say? Well, the things that he brings to their attention really are something that all of us struggle with. It's disordered priorities, misplaced priorities that they are dealing with. They are focused on building their own houses while the Lord's house, the temple, is in ruins there in Jerusalem or what used to be Jerusalem. And honestly, it's sort of easy to sympathize with them, don't you think? Uh, I I mean, uh, it's pretty clear they're in a hard spot. Uh, They've come back. They don't have a lot of wealth, a lot of money. There's not a lot of infrastructure for them to deal with. Um, They've been out of the land for uh, a couple generations now. And and so it's not easy for them to eke out a living. And so the rationale goes, well, maybe what you need to do is you take care of yourself and those practical concerns, concerns that you really need to get under control before you start tending to other things like worship. What's wrong with that? Well, here's what's wrong. What you tend to first in life tends to be what you worship. <laughs> Isn't that true? Haven't you ever uh, felt something like that in your own life? It's not that the Lord didn't want them to have houses to live in or uh, to, you know, that he wanted them living, you know, in tents forever or things like that. But it was that they were busy with their houses while giving no thought to the Lord and his place in their lives uh, as they restarted their society. Honestly, Haggai's concern isn't about the temple per se. It's about their hearts. And there's heart work for them to do. It's about what place is the Lord going to take uh, in their lives. That's the issue that Haggai is dealing with. And you think about it, it's a pretty great opportunity that Judah and Israel have because uh, it's almost like they get a do-over button. Uh, They've been off in Babylonia. They come back Uh, to the land of Israel, the land promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, uh, the land of their history and their roots, and they get to start over. Having learned all of the lessons from their exile, like, wow, God really was true. He wasn't kidding when he said if we disobeyed him, he would remove us from the land. Yeah, he did that. And so we get to start over. And so you would think that there would be a, a very sharp concern to do it right this time, and to do it in the way that God wants them to do it. Uh, But um, honestly, they get off on the wrong foot. Now, we have to admit that practical needs are really important, right? I mean, um, if there's a fire burning down your house, it's probably best to, to put that out before you go to worship, right? I mean, uh, Jesus even spoke of this when he said, you know, is it, a, is it permissible to heal a man on the Sabbath, uh, to do good or to do evil? Uh, he said, and yeah, it was. And so it's not so much a, a legality that Haggai is talking about or, or, or wanting to draw attention to. He's talking about uh, their heart for worship. And, um, <clears throat> and sometimes taking care of some practical things or legitimate things to take care of because you can do that and still have a heart to worship. But the problem comes when we persist in putting other things before the Lord. And so uh, it actually just doesn't work out so good. You you think the shortcut is going to work out well, like I'll get this taken care of and then we'll worship the Lord. And actually it just doesn't work that way. It's sort of like putting the caboose in front of the train. Excuse me. 
God's working through this. And in verse 5, you kind of see uh, what he calls them to do and what he calls them to reflect on. He says in verse 5, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You know, just that in itself is almost worth just emphasizing. Because that's something that we really don't do. Uh, we get so caught up with our busyness uh, today and filling our plates completely full that sometimes we just don't take the time to reflect and to slow down and say, how's this working out? And that's what God calls them to right here. He says, I want you to look at your lives and look at how is this and ask the question, how is this working out? He says in verse six, you have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And uh, it's like it's driving home the boy. If you just step back and reflect on your life, putting those practical things first, or trying to get all of our ducks in a row before we really seek the Lord, is something that keeps us from truly seeking the Lord and in fact, it never satisfies. I can remember that was really the story of my life. As I was early in my Christian life, I was a believer. Uh, I had come to faith through Christ. I had believed on him to forgive my sins. I knew that he had died for me on the cross, that I could know God through him. But there were those practical concerns that just got in the way of me giving myself fully to him. Practical concerns like social standing with my friends that I kind of wanted to protect or an image that I wanted to project. And you know what happened as a result? I didn't grow in the Lord because he wasn't first in my life. And that's sort of what the point that Haggai is making here is that um, <clears throat> when we don't put the Lord first, it really doesn't work out all that good. It's clear here that God's not going to let them prosper by living out wrong priorities. So he continues on, and, and in verse 9, he says, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew it away. The Lord blew it away. Why, declares the Lord? Because of my house, which remains in a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of what... Uh, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. And I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain and uh, new wine and olive oil and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and all uh, the labor of your hands. In other words, it's the Lord himself said, I'm not going to let you be fruitful this way. Why? Well, really, you're not designed to live that way. And that's not what it means to be a child of God, to belong to the Lord, to be in relationship with him, or to be a follower of Christ. And so um, the interesting thing is, is how responsive the Jewish people are to what Haggai says. I mean, it's really surprising because with the other prophets, we're so used to them um, <laughs> putting the Lord off or being really obstinate. But look at, look at the response of Zerubbabel and um, Joshua, the priest, the high priest, and, the, and then the remnant of the people. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the Lord. In other words, they put God first and they revered him. It's not that they were terrified of him. It was that they were in awe of him and they worshiped him. And that's what fear uh, means there. And so it's really a beautiful response. It goes on, and the Lord then responds uh, to their repentance and to their putting him first. And, and he gives them this promise, I am with you, declares the Lord, verse 13. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, uh, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josadak, the high priest and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. And they came and they began to work on the house of uh, the Lord Almighty, their God. 
And that was, and actually you can date it September 21st, 520 uh, BC in talking about that. I think there's a couple of important applications and connections that we need to make. Do you remember that when we, when we look at the Old Testament and we understand it uh, from the perspective of being Christians, uh, from the perspective of belonging to Christ and after what Jesus Christ has done for us, we have a, we, we have a, um, a filled-in perspective on it. In other words, all of the Old Testament refers to Christ and speaks of him. Jesus himself said that. And so we have to understand it that way. And so when, when we understand that they were called to work on the temple, we understand that that doesn't mean that we're supposed to go work on a temple, right? Because there's not going to be another physical temple. Uh, the Lord himself is our temple. Do you remember in John chapter 2? Uh, we looked at this uh, several weeks ago in men's group on Thursday morning, uh, back when we could get together as groups. Um, but it was talking about Jesus at the temple, and he said, uh, uh, this temple be, des- be destroyed and I will rebuild it in three days. And he's talking about himself. And so Jesus Christ himself is the temple. Furthermore, the New Testament goes on. And in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul makes this statement, for we are God's workers in his service and you are God's field. You are God's building. He goes down a few more verses and he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that temple person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. And so they actually worked on a physical structure that God was calling them to work on. And, uh, and we don't work on a physical structure. We work on the organic temple of the people of God. An important connection to make. That is what God is calling us to do is to serve uh, in like manner in building up the temple of God, the people of God. I think that there's a couple of other applications uh, out of this uh, chapter one of Haggai. I can't help but wonder if the Lord is not doing something similar in our own day with uh, what's going on with the coronavirus and uh, all over the world. Uh, This pandemic is, is, is it something that God is using to get the world's attention, I mean, it's pretty staggering. The United States is a great example. Our, our economy was roaring along, like as strong as it had ever been, maybe. I don't know. Some, some say it was doing well anyway. And all of a sudden, we're into a major recession within a matter of days because of a micro that infects people and makes people really sick. All over the world, the global economy is sinking. And uh, people are wondering, what do we do? How do we get enough supplies? Our supply chains are, are maxed out. Um, and uh, healthcare is, is pushing the limits of their capability and trying to save people's lives. And, and it's a fan, frantic struggle. And I just wonder if God is saying, what are you trusting in? What are you trusting in, people? Do you see that you are not as strong as you think you are? And that's a lesson that I have to think about and take to heart often. I think that is what God is doing. I think God is firmly in control of everything that is going on, even if we're not. Uh, in Haggai, we're going to see that God says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And God does that sometimes, and it, and it reminds us. Do you remember in, in Joel and in Zephaniah, it talks about the day of the Lord? I think we're experiencing a day of the Lord, not the day of the Lord, not the final and ultimate day of the Lord when Christ returns, but we are experiencing a day of the Lord. You remember what Joel taught us? Is that when we experience that, we're to look up and say, God, what do you want from me? Because responsive repentance brings grace and blessing right? And I think that's an application for us as we look at Haggai and uh, in our current situation, I think he is showing us how easily what we trust in can just go away. Um, It's important to realize that God doesn't want us to respond with fear, but with trust. 
and to know that the Lord himself is sufficient to take care of us and that he can meet all of our needs and that he has all authority and is in control. I think there's a second application here. I also think that Haggai's words instruct us to, in spite of turmoil, not let fear eclipse the bigger picture of what God is doing. If we could just kind of step back and step up, uh, rise up to a 30,000 you know, foot level to see the whole lay of the land at once, if we had eyes that, that would allow us to do that, I think that we would see that God is doing awesome things even in the midst of this uh, terrible pandemic. Is there bad stuff going on? Yeah, yeah, there is. And there always has been. And guess what? There will be until Christ returns. But is there good stuff going on right now? Absolutely, there is. I even think the hiccups that we're having with not being able to meet as a church could be a really good thing for us as we learn how to do church in a different way and not just go through our routines and the comfort of our routines. I think that there is a bigger picture. And maybe other ministries will open up to us as a result of uh, not allowing fear to make us myopic and make us just focus on ourselves and how am I going to get along to look up and say, how can I bless others during this time? That's what Christians have always done. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our, our Savior who lives within us. Let's put that kind of perspective in our hearts. So these are important times. And it wasn't easy for the Israelites that went back to the land uh, that they were from after the exile. It's not easy for us, but God is doing great things. And God is saying here, I'm with you. I am in your midst and I am going to take care of you. Be easy to look at Haggai and say, well, this is just, uh, he's just talking about the Old Testament temple and that, uh, all those religious ceremonies, they don't apply to us anymore, but that's not really it at all. What Haggai chapter one does is it raises the issue of priorities as uh, really in the form of a question. How do I approach a godly life or a life that has a solid foundation? Should I put practical needs first or should I put spiritual devotion to the Lord? And Haggai is saying, put the Lord first and you will have a firm foundation and God will be with you and his presence will guide you. Zerubbabel and the people made a great change as a result. And at the end of Haggai 1, we see their response of obedience and devotion to the Lord. Pretty, pretty amazing, uh, pretty exemplary for us. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be discouragement to come. And that comes up in Haggai chapter 2, uh, the last chapter of Haggai. So let's look at what it says in, verses, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, that would correspond to October 17th, 520 BC. So just about a month later, after they started building, uh, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, and he said, said uh, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it not look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, uh, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when I came to you out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. In other words, there was a, a situation there in which they had been working on uh, this new temple, the Lord's house, for about a month. And some of them maybe kind of were old enough to remember, that's not anything like Solomon's temple. It's not near as grand. There's not near as much gold. Uh, it's not near as ornate. It's kind of small compared to what Solomon's temple was. And and probably they began to wonder, is this even worth it? 
is this even going to make uh, enough of a, a, a difference? But the Lord has something to say in that. In other words, they were probably thinking, my efforts are so impotent. My, my, my feeble effort, they're really not making a difference. As I seek to work in ministry, maybe it's with my Awana group or my kids and trying to touch base with them uh, to disciple them. Maybe it has to do with youth ministry or um, trying to mentor somebody or our try. I just don't feel like we're getting anywhere. I don't think I'm making a difference in the world. Ever felt that way? Well, they did. And it's interesting to note what the Lord's response to them is. Look at verse, I think it's verse four. But now be strong declares the Lord. Be strong, uh, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people, for I and, and work, for I am with you. This is what I covenanted with you uh, when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. In verse 31, it says, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He continues on with the parallel parable, another parable with really the same message. Or point. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. What's he saying? He talks about the mustard seed. Maybe you've seen one. It's about 16th to an eighth of an inch in size. It's dwarfed by pumpkin seed or some kind of a gourd or something like that. And yet he says that seed starts so small and yet it becomes the biggest plant in the garden. Bread, making bread. The kingdom of heaven is also like this. There's a whole bunch of flour and water, 60 pounds of it according to that. And she puts in a pinch of yeast, leaven, or however much she puts in, a little bit. You don't put in equal amounts, right? You wouldn't have any bread. (laughs) Put in a little bit, and she mixes it in, and that little bit expands through all the dough. God says, that's how I work in the world. So don't you look at this little meager work that you're doing here, and you think, well, this is such a scrawny little temple. It doesn't matter. It matters, and I'm going to make it matter. You just be strong, and you keep at your work because I'm with you, and my spirit is in you. And he goes on to explain why. In verse 6, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. Once more. See, God does that every once in a while. He shakes the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake the nations and what is desired by all nations will come and it will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The glory of this present house, this little scrawny work that you're doing is going to be greater than Solomon's temple. He says the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house says the Lord, in this place, in this place, I will grant peace. What is he talking about? He's saying that his son, we know, Jesus, is going to enter this temple. And when he does, the glory of this temple is going to be greater than anything Solomon knew or experienced in his temple. Of course, we know from the Gospels that Jesus went to the temple several times. And every time it did, there was glory there. And so God says, don't be discouraged by small beginnings. Because 
You just need to trust me. I'm going to bring great things out of it. It's how the kingdom works, just like a mustard seed or a little bit of leaven. Well, what about the the last part of chapter 2? Well, there's another promise that Haggai makes. Um, Not only uh, the promise of blessing with with proper priorities, chapter 1, or promise of confidence in in the way that God works with small beginnings, the first part of chapter 2, there is also confidence in the kingdom's power. So in chapter 10, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10, uh, he uh, transitions again and brings another message. It says, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. If someone carries carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, And their fold touches some bread, stew, uh, wine, olive oil, or other food. Does it become consecrated too? Because it touched the fold of the garment that carried the consecrated meat. And they said, well, no, it doesn't work like that. And he says, well, what about someone who touches a dead body? Uh, If they touch a dead body and then they touch some of that food, bread, olive oil, um, wine, or whatever, Uh, Does it become defiled? And they said, yeah, it becomes defiled. And then Haggai says, well, so it is with this people, this nation in my sight. Whatever they do and whatever they offer uh, there is defiled. And he's talking about um, Israel's inability uh, to really honor God, uh, to really become his people and live as his people when they don't trust in him and put him first in their lives. And so uh, he brings that up, but that's not how it ends. He then, he then goes on and look at verse, uh, verses 20 through 23 and, uh, and what Haggai says there. And he, he promises uh, that he's going to bring a blessing and uh, be in the midst of his people. It says, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms, and I will overthrow chariots and their uh, drivers, horses, and their riders. Does that sound like them coming out of Egypt? Yeah, it does. It reminds us of the Exodus. They will fall. Uh, each by the sword of his brother. And he says, verse 23, on that day declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, what does that mean? Well, Zerubbabel was in the line of David. In fact, you can see it both in Matthew's genealogy Uh, in chapter 1 of Matthew, and you can see it in uh, Luke chapter 3 in the uh, genealogy of Jesus that he gives there. And so Zerubbabel is a symbol of the person of Jesus Christ. That's really who Haggai is referring to here uh, 500 years before Jesus would come onto the scene. And he says, I'm going to make you like my signet ring. And you know what that means? That means Jesus Christ is going to have the authority and uh, the ownership of God Almighty as he comes into this world. So what that means for you and me is because we know Christ as our Savior and Lord, we're secure. And that God is, his kingdom is going to come with power because of who Christ is. And because he lives within us, we're going to be people who Don't need to fear, even in times of turmoil. And as I look at the book of Haggai, what I I pick up from it uh, is this simple sentence. In times of turmoil, uh, focus on the proper priorities, have confident faith in God's promises, and confidence in in the kingdom's power. Let me say that another way. Times of turmoil call for proper priorities, faith in God's promises, and confidence in Jesus' power. So I hope that you will live that way in these days. I think as the people of Grace Point, you know, one thing that's always been true of us is that we look for ways to serve. 
I, I remember seeing so many examples of that over the years since we've been here. A, a remarkable body of the Lord serving when the time gets tough. We've already seen that happen around us even the last few weeks. But I encourage us to, to stand not in fear, but in confidence and faith and look for opportunities to share God's love during this time in appropriate ways. Not that we want to, uh, to, to not socially uh, distance ourselves appropriately, but maybe we could run some errands for people. Or maybe we could serve someone who doesn't have not only toilet paper, but maybe food uh, or uh, a a tank of gas or uh, some other hardship. Maybe somebody lost a job and they just need a little bit of help. Those are the things that we ought to be looking forward to. Opportunities to serve. Thanks so much for being a part today. Uh, God bless you all. Let's, Let's close in prayer together. Father, we thank you for Haggai and for the clarity of his book and for how he really diagnoses um, our ability to get our priorities misplaced and to put other things before you. Lord, would you call us back to enthroning you over our lives and yielding control to you? And then would you be with us and be our our center and would you accomplish more in our lives than we can even uh, imagine Lord, your word says in Ephesians 3 that you're going to do that. You're going to accomplish more than we can imagine or even conceive. And we just thank you for that, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would keep us safe during this time, that you would be our shield and defense, and that you would give us opportunities uh, to point others to your love and to your son. We pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. I miss you all.